Let's go on with Matthew chapter 27 this evening. Matthew 27. We're halfway through the passion story in Matthew's gospel, Matthew 26 and 27. Remembering that by the word passion here, we mean the suffering of Jesus. And we've seen his last supper with the disciples, his prayer time in Gethsemane, and then the arrest, his trial before Caiaphas, the denial of Peter, and now we'll pick it up in chapter 27. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And they bound him and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate, the governor. Then when Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. They said, what's that to us? See to it yourself. And throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple, he departed and he went and hanged himself. But the chief priests, taking the pieces of silver, said, It is not lawful to put them into the treasury, since it is blood money. So they took counsel and bought with them the potter's field as a burial place for strangers. Therefore that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken by the prophet Jeremiah, saying, and they took the 30 pieces of silver, the price of him on whom a price had been set by some of the sons of Israel. And they gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord directed me. All right. When Judah saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind. I keep repeating, there's no point on speculating in what scripture doesn't tell us, but one wonders what Judas expected if he, I mean, it sounds as though he hadn't expected this, and when he saw that this had happened, he changed his mind. Sounds as like he expected something else. I don't know what that possibly could have been in any sense. There's no, trying to, no point in trying to guess. And what was going on precisely in Judas's mind throughout it's hard to say. Scripture tells us that he did it out of greed, so that was certainly a factor. One suspects that something more was going on, but we don't know, and so there's no point guessing again. But now at any rate, greedy though he may have been, now at any rate, the money doesn't mean anything to him. He confesses that the one he has betrayed was innocent, throws the money at the feet of the chief priests as though that's going to make them change their mind about what they're doing to Jesus. And then they simply say, that's your problem. You deal with it. So Judas goes and hangs himself. Now, Matthew, I think more than any of the other gospels, tells us that something that happened fulfilled what was found in the prophets, fulfilled something spoken in the Old Testament. He does that more often than any other gospel, and he's going to do it in verse 9 here. But it's interesting, throughout Matthew chapter 27, there are a number of clear fulfillments of Scripture, and Matthew even words what he tells us in ways that echo those Scriptures, so, he know, so it's clear he wants us to see them, and yet he doesn't bother pointing it out. He doesn't signal that this is a fulfillment of Scripture, even though he tells it in a way which makes it clear that that's what's going on. And what we have here is not exactly a fulfillment of prophecy. Well, it's not a fulfillment of prophecy at all, but it is a close parallel to what happened to David and his quote-unquote friend Ahithophel, who had been his advisor and who betrayed him. Ahithophel went over to Absalom when Absalom revolted, betraying David. And then what happened when Ahithophel's counsel was not followed? Do you remember? He went and hanged himself. 2 Samuel chapter 17, verse 23. So, I mean, it's clear again that what happens to Ahithophel 
is paralleled by and anticipates what happens to Jesus. And if you want to put it this way, it's an interesting way of seeing it. David is betrayed by his so-called friend, and Jesus, David's son, right? The son of David, is betrayed by his friend. Or you could put it another way. David speaks of this betrayal by his so-called friend in a psalm, Psalm 41. And Jesus, who is often the second speaker, if you like, in the psalms, it happens to him as well. When I say that Jesus is the second speaker in the psalms, there are a number of psalms which are clearly the expression of something going on in the psalmist's life. And yet they are also spoken by Jesus because they apply to him as well. Most clearly, Psalm 22. Remember how that begins? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now that's written by a psalmist. Something was going on in the psalmist's life that led him to write that. But Jesus speaks, he is the second speaker, perhaps the primary speaker we might want to say, of what's going on in the psalm. So anyway, there are these interesting parallels. What happens with David, how he is betrayed and his betrayer goes and hangs himself, anticipates and foreshadows what happens to David's son, Jesus the Messiah. Okay, Judas felt remorse but it led him not to repentance and forgiveness, but to despair and suicide. Paul speaks of the difference between different kinds of sorrow. 2 Corinthians 7.10, godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation, which is not to be regretted, whereas worldly grief produces death. There is a godly sorrow that is very appropriate when one has sinned, when one has done something wrong. And if it's a godly sorrow, it is a sorrow that leads to repentance, forgiveness, restoration. And there is a worldly sorrow over what, has, what one has done that doesn't bring that kind of repentance forgiveness, seeking forgiveness from God and restoration, but simply leads to despair and death. And clearly, if we want to apply that terminology to what's going on with Judas, his is not a godly sorrow leading to repentance, forgiveness, and restoration, but a sorrow that leads to despair and to death. Now, before I leave this, let me just say a word, I hope, with sensitivity about this issue of suicide. Because I suspect that many of us, if not all of us, have been touched, maybe very close at hand, maybe not so close at hand, but we've been touched by those who have committed suicide. And even those who profess faith, believers, who have committed suicide. Now, in the act of suicide itself, there is clearly an absence of faith. Because if you believed that God can bring good out of this evil, if you sincerely believe that this is in God's hand and he can turn this to good, you're not going to despair, give up and commit suicide. It is not an act of faith. That said, it is not for any of us to judge those who commit suicide. Their lives and what they have done is in God's hands, and God, let us remember, is merciful. We do not know what's going on in a person's mind or what's going on in a person's heart. We don't know what mental illness may have led them to act that way. We don't know what state of depression may have led them to act that way in a way for which they would not, they're not responsible in the same sense as they would if they were in full capacity of their, 
of their faculties and so on. We don't know what was going on, what state of mental health they were in or anything else. We don't know whether it was an, a sudden act in a moment of weakness or whether it was something that had been contemplated for a long time. We just don't know, which is just a reminder that as Paul tells us, judge nothing before the times. People's lives are in God's hands. We are touched, we are very sorrowful when it happens, but we don't hold people guilty, judge them because that's for God to do, not for us. And just one more point, and that is, if we ever have the experience of speaking one with someone who is considering it, then of course we want to bring God into the picture. God can turn any situation, however desperate it may seem, to good, and even to your good, you who are despairing at the moment. So in that situation, we want to bring our faith in God into play and try and share it with the person who is tempted in this way. But when they do it, it's not for us to judge. Well, let's go on. Matthew 27, verse 11. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You have said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge. So that the governor was greatly amazed. All right, back in verse 1, we read that the chief priests and elders came up with a plan. They took counsel together. They came up with a plan for getting Jesus executed. They couldn't do that themselves because they're under Roman rule, and if someone's going to be executed, the Romans have to do it. They don't have the authority to do it. And they realize that the sort of ostensible reasons that they have for wanting to get rid of Jesus are not going to play well with Pilate. They were distressed with Jesus for breaking the Sabbath law. Pilate couldn't care a fig. Remember what happened to Paul when he was brought before the trial in Corinth and the governor said, if this is Jewish law that you see to it, I'm not gonna be concerned with any of these things. Pilate presumably wouldn't have either. The things that upset them the Sabbath breakings, the concerns about whether ritual purity, the kinds of things, even the charge of blasphemy, which is what they're bringing against him most recently before Caiaphas, or Caiaphas raises against him. Pilate's probably not going to be very concerned about that. So they have to come up with a plan. What kind of thing are we going to charge Jesus with that's going to impress Pilate so that Pilate will act upon it? And clearly what they came up with was that Jesus claims to be king of the Jews. This is clearly what they came up with because the first question Pilate asks Jesus is, are you the king of the Jews? Where did he get that from? Obviously that was the charge that was being brought against him. And whereas breaking the Sabbath or presumably ostensibly breaking the Sabbath or blasphemy isn't going to impress Pilate, hearing that somebody is promoting himself as a king of the Jews is going to get Pilate's attention, right? That sounds like someone setting himself up against the emperor. So they make the tactical choice to bring the charge against Jesus that he's claiming to be king of the Jews. And the first thing Pilate asks is, are you the king of the Jews? As you are being accused of, we might want to fill that in. Now remember when Jesus was before Caiaphas that there were false witnesses, we're told, who brought against him the charge that he said he was going to destroy the temple and raise it up in three days. And that, we said, was a garbled account of something that Jesus had actually said. It wasn't what Jesus had actually said, but it was a garbled account. There was something that Jesus said that was at the root of it but it was a garbled account of it that made it sound as though he's going to himself destroy the temple, which was not the case at all. Is this charge that Jesus says he is the king of the Jews, is that a garbled account of anything Jesus said? 
Well, the only thing that comes to my mind is that Jesus did claim and have his disciples go out and claim that the kingdom of God has come upon you. And he made it very clear that the coming of the kingdom of God, that the kingdom of God was coming with his ministry, that he was the one who was bringing in the kingdom of God. Now, it should be very clear to anyone listening to him that when he spoke of the kingdom of God, he was not speaking of an earthly kingdom. As Jesus says in John's gospel, my kingdom is not of this world. It's not that kind of kingdom at all. And so when the question is put to Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? He says, you said so. And I think the point is something similar as the last time. That's certainly not, there is a sense in which it's true, but it's not the way I would have put it, and it's not what you mean by it. So instead of saying yes or no, he says, you have said. Something like that seems to be Jesus' point. But again, this is not the kind of kingdom, and what Pilate has in mind, and the Jews have in mind when they accuse him of saying he's the king of the Jews, that's not true at all. Where did we get this, where did we run across this King of the Jews as a title for Jesus earlier in Matthew's Gospel? Well, you may remember, the wise men come to Herod, and what do they say to him? Where is he that is born King of the Jews? And Herod, of course, misunderstands that phrase just the same way the Jews are accusing Jesus of here before Pilate as an earthly kingdom, as a rival to him, and so he does all he can to get rid of Jesus. But that's where we encountered this expression before. And we're going to run into it twice more in, uh, in Matthew chapter 27, where the Roman soldiers mock Jesus as the fake king of the Jews and as the charge that is placed above his head on the cross, Jesus of, Nazareth, king, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Well, Jesus responds to this question by saying, you have said, and that's the last thing he says in Matthew's Gospel before he's on the cross. Pilate asks him other questions or other charges are brought against him and he answers nothing. And we saw this already when he was brought before Caiaphas. And I made the point there that two things at least are involved. Number one, the fulfillment of scripture, because Isaiah 53 verse seven talks about him being led as a sheep to the slaughter, but not opening his mouth. Jesus is fulfilling scripture by not responding to these charges, but he is also submitting to his father's will rather than exercising any attempt at self-defense. He's not going to try to defend himself and get out of it, because this is the cup that his father has prepared for him to drink. Let's go on with verses 15 to 24. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted, and they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. Or Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who was called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. All right, Pilate gets warned by his wife that Jesus is innocent don't have anything to do with him. And it's interesting, Matthew tells us that Pilate had already caught on to this by himself. Because Matthew says, Pilate knew that it was out of envy that they had brought him there. So on two counts, 
Pilate knows that Jesus is innocent. His wife's word from a dream and his own perception that he is being charged because of the envy of those who are charging him rather than because of any guilt of his own. All right, if you're a judge who realizes that the person brought before you is innocent, what are you supposed to do? Too obvious to say, so I won't bother saying it. Why doesn't Pilate do it? Clearly, he wants to remain on good terms with the crowd. Clearly, he doesn't well, and I mean, one can understand his thinking. He doesn't want a mob. He doesn't want an uprising. So he's a judge, and you can see that he actually wants to do the right thing. Let's give him that much credit. I'll get to that in a minute. He wants to do the right thing, but he also wants to avoid a disturbance for obvious reasons. And so Pilate, realizing that Jesus is innocent, makes three attempts at getting him released. He doesn't just do the right thing and release him, but he tries to have it both ways. Let's try and, content and keep the crowd content at the same time as Jesus gets released. So attempt number one, I'm supposed to release a prisoner to you, and we've got this notorious criminal over here, so which of the two do you want me to release? Thinking, this is a good way to get Jesus released. Except it doesn't work. Because the chief priests and the elders, who are the moving force behind this whole process, get the crowd all riled up to shout, we want Barabbas rather than Jesus. Attempt number one has failed. Attempt number two, why? What evil has he done? To which he does not get a response. That is, he doesn't get a response to his question. All they do is shout the louder, let him be crucified. And now he realizes that this is really getting out of hand. And so he makes a third attempt. He is attempting... He's not doing the right thing, just going ahead and taking the consequences. He's not doing the right thing, but he's attempting to do the right thing at the same time as he wants to keep the crowd pleased. So third attempt, I'm going to wash my hands and say, if I do it, it's your responsibility, not mine. Third attempt, and it gets him no further than either of the first two. The crowd says, good enough his blood be on us and on our children. Now here we want to be very careful, and I'm going to come back to this in a few minutes. I suspect what I'm going to say doesn't hinge on this, but I suspect Matthew's gospel, and this is a common position among scholars, was written shortly after the year 70. And many of us will know what happened in the year 70. The Jews had revolted against Rome. It took its time because they were, they were very stalwart in their resistance. But eventually, Jerusalem fell and was burned, and the temple was destroyed in the year 70, and many Jews were taken off to Rome as captives and, and, and so on. And I'm sure Matthew saw, as others saw, what happened to the Jews in the year 70 as God's judgment for what they had done with Jesus. And when the words are spoken, his blood be on us and our children, that's precisely what happened because it was those who were still with them of that generation and their children who would still be alive at that generation to whom this destruction of Jerusalem came. What we must be careful not to do, and I'm gonna come back to this in a minute, is to do what unfortunately, tragically, disastrously, many people in the name of Christ, calling Jews Christ killers, did to them for centuries after this and up to modern times. Certainly through the medieval periods and later, this kind of charge was brought against the Jews. And of course, it's just anti-Semitism, it's racial prejudice and everything else, but it's giving a religious coloring to it by calling them Christ killers. <clears throat> 
and Jews have been horribly persecuted on that basis. Let's make it clear that that's not what's going on here, and I'll come back to that in just a minute. All right, Pilate makes three attempts, gets nowhere, and finally, having to choose between doing the right thing or keeping the crowd content, he chooses to keep the crowd content, and he releases Jesus to be crucified. So we come to verses 27 to 32. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole band before him, sorry, the whole battalion before him, and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and twining together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand, and kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit on him and took the reed and smote him on his head, struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. Oh, just one more verse. And as they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry his cross. Simon, we're told, of Cyrene, and that's presumably added to, again, make it clear that this is a different Simon from Simon Peter. This is Simon of Cyrene. Now, Matthew doesn't tell us, but here I'm going to pinch from Mark. Mark tells us that Simon was the father of Alexander and Rufus. Why would you say Simon is the father of Alexander and Rufus unless those for whom you are writing the gospel know whom Alexander and Rufus are and you're drawing this to their attention? Take this a step further. It is usually thought on fairly good grounds, though it's not the sort of thing we can be certain of, usually thought that Mark was written in Rome or for believers in Rome. And in Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 16, verse 13, he says, give my greetings to Rufus, who was elect in the Lord, and then a very interesting phrase, and his mother, who is my mother too. Apparently she had treated Paul very well. He had been in their home. But notice in Rome, there is a believer, a well-known believer, called Rufus. And Mark's gospel, which may well have been written for the Roman Christians in the first place, says that Simon of Cyrene was the father of Alexander and Rufus. Well, put the look to the dot, connect the docs if you like. We can't be certain, but it looks very well as though this Simon of Cyrene was the father of two people very well known to the Roman Christians from uh, Mark's Gospel and Romans chapter 16. All right, the soldiers are given the task of crucifying Jesus, and those who have done this kind of thing over the centuries have always excused their behavior by saying, I was just doing what I was told to do. I'm just carrying out my duty. These soldiers can't claim that because if they were just content to carry out their duty, why are they making a point of mocking Jesus? Why are they ridiculing? Why are they striking him? Why are they pretending as a king and dressing him in royal robes and putting a mock crown on his head and a, and a reed a kind of scepter in his hand? Why are they mocking him, ridiculing him in this way? If they're simply carrying out their duty, they bear responsibility, they bear guilt too. And as it turns out, absolutely nobody that has anything to do with this whole process, apart from Jesus himself, is innocent. Think about it. The disciples of Jesus, who flee at the first sound of trouble. Peter, who denies him. Judas, who betrays him, the chief priests and elders who are behind the whole process, the mob who cried out for Jesus to be crucified, Pilate, who tries to escape responsibility by washing his hands, but he's still the one who pronounced the judgment and didn't do the right thing, 
And even the Roman soldiers aren't simply carrying out their duties. They're making a point of ridiculing and mocking Jesus. So what are we to make of the way all these people, everybody involved in the story but Jesus himself, what are we to make of their behavior? Well, I'll tell you what we are not to make of their behavior. What we are not to say is, those awful Jews or those stupid disciples, we need to think of it this way. And I'm going to draw on a parallel from Romans chapter 3. After quoting scripture that talks about all being, nobody, nobody being righteous, they've all done all these wicked things, Paul writes, we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that the whole world may be guilty before God. What's the logical process behind that? The logic behind it is this. When scripture says all are guilty and so on, it's saying to the Jews, because the law was given to them. And if the Jews are guilty, then the whole world is guilty. Okay, what's the point of that? If the most favored, blessed nation on earth is nonetheless guilty before God, then it must certainly be true of everyone else. And that's the way we should be reading what's going on here. Not that the Jews are worse than anybody else, but that the Jews who are the most favored, blessed nation on earth nonetheless crucify the Son of God. And so if they are responsible for his death, surely everyone else is as well. Surely anyone else would have behaved the same way as well. And that's in fact what we see throughout this chapter. Not those awful Jews, they're worse than anybody else, but the most favored nation on earth, human nature at what ought to be its best, is resistant of God and wants to put his son to death. Christ died for all our sins. If he died for the sins of the most favored nation on earth, then surely he died for our sins as well. Finally, one more thought, and I'm going to draw this from Bach's St. Matthew Passion, which I've referred to a number of times before. Many people would say Bach is the greatest composer of all time. There is no way you can compare a Bach and a Beethoven, but we can at least say there is no composer greater than Johann Sebastian Bach. And many would say that his St. Matthew Passion is his greatest work. Again, there's no way to compare that with other great works but he at least wrote nothing greater than the St. Matthew Passion, which is his setting to music of Matthew 26 to 27. The whole text, every word in those two chapters is set to music. And between these settings of the text, there are chorales, hymns, and other solo songs that comment on what's happening. And the whole thing is so profound that Bach bears the name for many as the fifth evangelist because of the way he tells the story. But when Pilate says to the crowd, why, what evil has he done? Bach inserts a soprano singing, to all men Jesus good has done. He's done good to the blind, the lame, the demon possessed. Apart from the good, he has done nothing which is followed immediately by the high point in the whole St. Matthew Passion, a soprano solo singing, For love, my Savior now is dying. For love, my Savior now is dying. And dying for our sins, which is something we often say and we need to remember, but let us put it, let's put it in the very stark way we see it here. Dying for the sins of his enemies, us included. That's the way Paul puts it in Romans chapter 5. When we were God's enemies, he reconciled us to himself by his son. We were God's enemies, and God showed his love by having Christ died for us. But they were also Christ's enemies. In fact, they were bringing false charges against him, fleeing from him, betraying him, scourging him, crucifying him. And Jesus, out of love 
for his enemies, out of love for those who crucify him, dies and sacrifices himself. Now, throughout these chapters, Jesus appears to be, and in one sense he is, completely passive. He's not even responding to charges brought against him. He is the one who is being accused, the one who is being tried, the one who is being condemned, the one who is being mocked, the one who is being crucified. He's passive in the whole thing. And yet, at the same time, we need to remember, no one takes his life from him but he lays it down of his own, and he lays it down out of love. We love, First John tells us, because he first loved us. Let that sink in as we contemplate these chapters. Amen.